Chemistry 4131 Heat Capacity Ratios for Gases Let's first look at the experimental setup. In this experiment, we use a barometer to measure the pressure of atmosphere, manometer to measure pressure of the system. Barometer contains a glass tube filled with mercury. One end of the tube is sealed on the vacuum, the other side exposed to atmosphere. The height of mercury measures the pressure of atmosphere. Manometer contains an open U-tube. One side of the U-tube exposed to atmosphere, the other side connect to the system we want to measure. The height of the liquid inside of the U-tube measures the difference between the system and the atmosphere. In this experiment, the liquid we used is dibutadiate. To convert the height of this liquid into mercury height, we need to multiply by a conversion factor that's the density of the liquid over the density of the mercury. So the pressure of the system is therefore the pressure of atmosphere plus the difference. In this case, the pressure of atmosphere is labeled P2, that is measured by barometer. And the difference is the height of the liquid times the conversion factor, and that gives you millimeter mercury height. The system contains a big glass bottle, carboy, a rubber stopper with three holes in it, so that we can insert three tubes into these three holes. The three tubes are controlled by three screw clamps labeled A, B, and C. A controls, glass, uh, sorry, controls uh, gas flow from cylinder to carboy. B controls uh, the gas flow from carboy to atmosphere, and the C connect to the carboy to the manometer. After the system is assembled, we now open clamps A and B, but close C, so that uh, the gas from cylinder can go into the carboy. Now, if the gas is argon, and argon is heavier than air, so it will fill the bottom of the carboy first. If the a carboy contains uh, 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 air before the experiment. Argon will fill up the uh, bottle and pushes air out of the system. If we allow the gas to sweep through the carboy for 15 minutes with 100 millimeter per second, the carboy will fall off argon without any air. In order to measure the pressure, we need to open clamp C. But we have to do it very carefully because if we do too fast, uh, the gas will blow away the liquid in the manometer and that will make a mess. So to do that, we need to partially close A to reduce the gas flow and then carefully open C so that it is connected to manometer and then cautiously clamp off B. Okay, now because the system is still connected to the cylinder, so uh, the pressure will increase with time. Okay, so the height h will increase. Now, to measure accurately, we, we need a large uh, value of this height, but not too high, okay, because that will also uh, possible to blow away the liquid. So the optimum uh, height is 600 millimeter. So when H approaches 600 millimeter, then we close A, okay, the clamp A. So now the system or the carboy now is sealed, okay, connect to the manometer. So um, at this point, okay, um, you will see the height may slightly change with time. So you let it stabilize for about 15 minutes, and then you measure the height. So this height is H1, okay? That's the first uh, 
uh, initial state. Okay, you measure H1, and then using this equation, plug into this equation. Okay, P2 is the atmosphere. Okay, measured by barometer. So here, barometer, and using this equation, you calculate P1. Okay, now comes the important step. You remove this stopper uh, about two or three inches vertically, but immediately replace the stopper tightly as quickly as possible. This step must be done very quickly. Okay? Now, when you remove the stopper, you will see the edge, the height drops to zero. Okay? And then when you close it, then the height will increase again. Okay? So you will let the system stabilize for about 15 minutes, and then you measure the height again. So this height is H3. All right? And then plugging this equation, uh, you can calculate H, uh, P3. So that's the finer pressure. Okay? So again, uh, in this experiment, you measure P1. That's the initial state. And the P3, the finer state. And the P2 is the uh, atmosphere. Okay? You can measure that at any time during the experiment. Now, for each gas, okay, you will uh, repeat the steps three times. So three, uh, you do three measurements for each gas. Now let's turn to the theory and derive equation to calculate the heat capacity ratio. So this diagram shows the process. The system initially uh, at P1, V1, T1. And when the stopper is opened and replaced immediately, the system uh, becomes P2, V2, and T2. And then with time, it changes to find the state P3, V3, T3. Now, when we open the stopper, some gas is pushed out of the system. And so it is important to define where is the system. Okay, so one way to think about it is we can imagine there's a dot line uh, in the initial state where the below this line, this is the system. And the gas uh, above the line, uh, when you open the stopper, all the gas above the line will be pushed out of the system. So in other words, uh, all the volume below this line will become the volume of the carboy. So here, okay, that comes from the system, all right? So, um, so V1 increase to V2 becomes the volume of the carboy. And also because uh, the uh, gas do work to the surrounding, you can imagine um, the, uh, the work is negative, so the uh, temperature decrease, so T2 should uh, decrease, and the second step should increase temperature. And also, second step is a constant volume, because the volume of the carboy of the gas doesn't change. But what about the first step? Remember, in the procedure, we mentioned that we open, remove the stopper, and replace it immediately, very quickly. So this is a very fast step. And because it's so fast that the system does not have enough time to absorb heat, and therefore this step is considered as adiabatic expansion, reversible adiabatic. So Q is zero according to the first law, du equals dw. And if the gas is considered the ideal gas, then internal energy is Cv delta T and the work is negative pressure times volume change. Now, um, we can derive several equations for the reversible adiabatic expansion using this equation, as we shown in the uh, lecture notes. Okay? So here we skip all those steps, and one of the conclusion is pressure volume to the gamma's power is constant. Okay? So if you uh, forget uh, how we derive this equation, please go back to the lecture notes and see how we derive this equation. Okay, so in this equation, gamma 
is the ratio CP over CV. So that's the one we want to measure. All right. So uh, to calculate gamma in the, using this equation, we need to uh, modify uh, this equation. So we can calculate the P2 over P1. Okay. So both sides divide by P1. The right side becomes P2 over T1. The left side, if we divide by V2 gamma's power, so V1, V2 to the gamma's power. Okay. So these two equations are equivalent. And now if we apply natural log on both sides, okay, and gamma can go to in front of the natural log, so that becomes gamma ln v1 v2. Okay, so using this equation, we can calculate the gamma. So gamma becomes ln p2 over p1 divided by uh, ln v1 over v2. Let's look at the equation we just derived to calculate the heat capacity ratio. In this equation, P2 is the pressure when we just open or remove the stopper. And so the pressure becomes atmosphere. So P2 is the atmosphere that measured by a parameter. Now, P1 is the pressure before you open the stopper. And so this is measured by the height of the liquid, uh, so H1, uh, in the procedure. So P1 can be calculated. Now V2 is the volume of the uh, a carboy, so that can be measured. But the V1 is the imagined volume that will occupy the uh, carboy. So V1 cannot be measured. And therefore, this equation, uh, we need to uh, replace V1 by something else that we can measure. Okay, so let's look at the second step. Okay, second step when we uh, replace the uh, stopper, and the volume remains constant. So V2, V3 are the same, and therefore it's a constant volume process. Okay. So because volume is constant, so V3 equals V2. Okay, V2 is the volume of the carboy. And uh, uh, with enough time, the system becomes uh, equilibrium with the surrounding T3 increase eventually becomes the room temperature T1. Same thing as initial temperature. That's the room temperature. Okay, so the final state is the P3 V2, T1. Okay, V2 is the uh, volume of the carboy, and T1 is the room temperature. Now remember, this comes from the imagined volume. So we can look at the initial state and the final state and write a gas law. Okay, that is P1, V1 over T1. That's the initial state, and uh, P3, V3, T3. That's the final state. But V3 is V2. Okay, we can replace V3 by V2. That's the gas volume of the carboy. And the T3 is replaced by T1. That's the uh, temperature of the uh, sister surrounding. So uh, same as the room temperature. Okay, so compare these two equations. T1 is the same, and therefore P1 V1 equals P3. V2. Okay, we can modify this equation to become V1 over V2. So V1 over V2 equals P3 over P1. Okay, now look at the equation for calculating the heat capacity. On the bottom, we have natural log V1 over V2. Okay, this can be replaced by P3 over P1. So now we have equation to calculate the gamma is the natural log P2 over P1, P3 over P1. Everything is the pressure. P2 is atmosphere. P1 is the initial pressure, which is measured by H1. P3 is the final pressure, which is measured by H3. And again, P1 is measured by H1.
all right so you need to convert to uh, mercury height plus the atmosphere okay you get this p p1 and p3 now this equation we can also write written as ln p2 minus ln p1 divided by ln p3 minus ln p1 so either uh, way we can use to calculate the gamma okay we just derived the equation that we can use to calculate heat capacity ratio uh, by experiment but what is the heat capacity ratio from uh, predicted by theory heat capacity is defined as the energy needed to increase temperature one degree so in mathematics it's dq over dt so heat divided by temperature if volume is a constant then q is delta u so heat capacity should be internal energy derivative of temperature under constant volume in chapter one kinetic model we show that gas molecules possess the same kinetic energy at the same temperature so temperature is a measure of kinetic energy uh, in average one molecule has a kinetic energy 3 over 2 kt k is boltzmann constant so for one more of molecules you need to times have gaudio's number so k times n a will be r constant and therefore the average kinetic energy for one more molecules gas molecules is 3 over 2 rt okay so according to uh, this equation cv should be the derivative of internal go over temperature so 3 over 2 rt derivative over temperature should be 3 over 2 r okay so that's the theoretical prediction of cv now this is for monatomic gas okay again for cp then is a cv plus r should be 5 over 2 r so the theoretical prediction for gamma uh, of monatomic gas should be 5 over 3. according to equal partition of energy theorem energy is distributed on average equally among all energetically accessible degrees of freedom there will be an average thermal energy of half kt k or kb is boltzmann constant associated with each coordinates for example for translation in three dimension so we have x direction y direction and the z direction along x direction the kinetic energy is half m v x squared or we can written as 2m momentum along x direction squared so px squared over 2m and along y direction is p y squared momentum along y direction squared divided by 2m and similarly that's uh, for z direction we can also write as pz squared divided by 2m so the total kinetic energy for one molecule uh, can be written as this in other words this uh, for three dimension translation we have three independent degrees of freedom so according to part equal partition of energy theorem on average uh, the kinetic energy along xyz are equally distributed each direction has half kt so half kt for x half kt for y half kt for z so the total uh, kinetic energy for one molecule should be 3 over 2 kt and for one more of molecule will be 3 over 2 rt and that is consistent what we get uh, from kinetic model as shown in the last slide and this is for monatomic gas what about diatomic gas diatomic molecules not only translate but also rotate and vibrate uh, the center of mass translation has uh, again uh, three degrees of freedom and therefore the kinetic energy for translation is uh, again three times half kt for one molecule from for one more 
is 3 times uh, half RT. Okay, so uh, the heat capacity will be the derivative of this energy over temperature, and that gives you 3 over 2R. That's for the contribution from translation. Now, rotation, uh, it turns out that for diatomic molecule along the molecular axis, the rotational uh, moment inertia is zero. And so there's only two uh, independent degree of freedom. Okay, so you have two of them. Both are perpendicular to this mo molecular axis. So because we have two degree of freedom instead of three, so you choose two times half uh, kT for one molecule or RT for uh, one more, and that gives you RT. The derivative RT over temperature gives you R. So that's the contribution uh, for uh, heat capacity uh, from rotation uh, for diatomic molecule only have two degrees of freedom. Now for uh, vibration, uh, for diatomic molecule, vibration only have one degree of freedom along molecular axis. But the vibration uh, contains kinetic energy and the potential energy. So again, according to equal partition theorem, each of them has half kT. So you have two times uh, half kT for one molecule, or RT for one more of molecule, and that gives you RT. And the derivative over temperature gives you R. All right, so for vibration, uh, even though we have one degree of freedom, uh, you have both kinetic energy and the potential energy. So the total uh, heat capacity should be at uh, your uh, sum of all these contribution from translation, rotation, and vibration and that give you seven over two R. Okay, so that's theoretical prediction uh, for diatomic molecule uh, for heat, constant heat, volume heat capacity. Assuming uh, all translation, rotation, vibration contribute uh, to the heat capacity. Now, what about the linear molecule uh, more than two atoms? Well, diatomic molecule actually is a special case for linear molecule. The translation for uh, uh, the center of mass is uh, again three dimensions, so three uh, degree of freedom. So translation is the same for monatomic, for diatomic, for linear, or even for nonlinear. They are all three independent degree of freedom, so three over two R. Uh, rotation for linear molecule again. Because it's linear along molecular axis, the rotational uh, degree of freedom is zero. So you have only two. Again, you have two degree of freedom, two times half RT that give you RT. Derivative of temperature give you R. That's the heat capacity contributed from uh, rotation. And what about vibration? Okay, so now um, in order to calculate vibration, um, an energy, you need to know how many atoms. So assuming we have n number of atoms, each atom has three degree of freedom. So the total degree of freedom should be three times n. If you have n atoms, that's the total degree of freedom. Now for uh, the uh, linear molecule, um, the uh, translation center of mass a, you have three at uh, three degree of freedom. Uh, rotation, if it's linear, you have two uh, degree of freedom. So the total degree of freedom minus uh, di uh, minus translation minus rotation, and that give you uh, the degree of free uh, freedom for vibration. Again, vibration has kinetic energy and the potential energy, so you need to times two. So two times 3n minus 5. 5 is because 3 comes from translation, 2 comes from rotation, and that gives you minus 5 times half uh, rt, and then derivative of t, and that's the uh, vibration uh, contribution to the heat capacity. So if we add all these together, 
translation rotation vibration and that give you the heat capacity for linear molecules okay in general now what about nonlinear linear so translation again 3 over 2 rt same you have 3 degree of freedom but now the rotation is not 2 but 3 so you should use 3 times half rt for one more that give you 3 over 2 r all right for a uh, con uh, constant volume heat capacity um, for vibration again we use a uh, total number of molecules 3n minus 3 because of the translation 3 because of the rotation and that give you 3n minus 6 okay then you need to times 2 okay and then half r all right so the total uh, contribution to heat capacity you add all together and that give you 6n minus 6 times r over 2 and so these are the theoretical prediction for the heat capacity for diatomic molecule or linear molecule or non-linear molecules okay remember these uh, other predictions assuming uh, translation rotation vibration all contribute to the heat capacity let's compare the theoretical predicted value of heat capacity with experimental data so theory predicts that for monatomic gas the heat capacity is 3 over 2 r or 12.47 joule per mole per kelvin okay this is due to the translational energy here is the experimental data for helium neon argon and you can see they match very well the result is impressive so in this experiment you will uh, perform experiment measurements on one of these monatomic gas and you compare your results with the reported result okay now theory predict for diatomic molecule hydrogen nitrogen oxygen uh, the heat capacity is 7 over 2 r and that is 29.10 joule per mole per kelvin and this is due to the uh, translation uh, vibration and the rotation so they all contribute uh, to the kinetic energy so here is experimental data okay and you can see uh, they are not uh, actually uh, same in fact there is a difference is about r constant so r that's the difference between theory and the experiment okay it's about r and if you go back to the theory uh, you will see that a r constant uh, is about the contribution from either vibration or rotation uh, for diatomic molecule so for some reason diatomic molecule heat capacity is contributed by translation and uh, either vibration or rotation but not both okay so either translation or uh, sorry either vibration or rotation does not contribute to the kinetic energy for diatomic molecule to understand this we need to look at the quantum mechanic effect in quantum mechanics molecules can only be found in discrete energy states here shows the energy states for translation rotation and vibration note that the energy spacing between translation energy levels are very small for rotation uh, the spacing is larger and for vibration it's the largest okay i want to mention that here the, the these are not accurate representation of their energy levels and this is because for translation the energy spacing is 10 to the minus 37 and for rotation 10 to the minus 23 and it is impossible to draw here the accurate energy spacings this yellow color uh, indicates the thermal energy okay, due to the temperature for example room temperature and you can see at room temperature there's a large number of uh, translation energy levels uh, are occupied 
Okay, so in other words, translation energy contribute to the uh, kinetic energy. Okay, at the room temperature. Now for rotation, and there's also significant amount of energy levels are occupied. So at room temperature, rotation energy levels are also active. They contribute to the energy. On the other hand, the spacing between vibration energy level exceeds the thermal energy at room temperature. So thermal energy at room temperature is not high enough to excite molecular vibrations. And therefore, with no ability to excite diatomic or polyatomic molecular vibrations, gas has lower heat capacity than predicted at low temperatures, because at low temperatures, vibration does not contribute to the energy. Now, in, for some gases at a certain temperature, they may partially uh, contribute, and, and therefore you may see uh, various uh, numbers, okay, values for the heat capacities. This diagram shows the heat capacity of a hydrogen molecule uh, as a function of temperature. So at a very low temperature, only translation energy contributes the heat capacity. So when the temperature increase between uh, here about 200 to 1000 Kelvin, um, thermal energy start to uh, populate rotational energy levels. So rotation energy level, uh, rotational energy contribute to the heat capacity. So only when temperature above here, that's 3000 Kelvin, then thermal energy is high enough to populate vibration energy levels. So now vibration energy contribute to the heat capacity. Here again shows the experimental setup. Uh, the carboy, a manometer, a gas cylinder. Comparing these two setups, one is for heavier molecules, such as argon, CO2, and the other one is for lighter molecules, such as hydrogen. Do you see the differences? For heavier molecules, you want the gas go inside the carboy to the bottom of the bottle. And because it's heavier, so it f uh, fills the bottom first and then goes up, all right, pushes other molecules uh, out of the system until it is full. Now, if it's a lighter molecule such as hydrogen, you want to go to the bottle, uh, to the top of the carboy. And then, because it's light, so it fills the top and then down pushes other gas out of the system until it is full. In this experiment, the system starts at state one with P1, V1, T1, and N1 moles of molecules. Immediately after you uh, remove the stopper and uh, replace it, the system becomes uh, state two with P2, V2, T2. Number of moles doesn't change. Okay, note P2 is the atmosphere measured by barometer. Okay, now the system stabilizes with time, eventually becomes uh, state three. So P3, V3, T3. Now V3 is the constant volume, so equals to V2. And T3 equals the room temperature, so V1, a T1, and the number of moles doesn't change. So in this experiment, uh, you measure the atmosphere using barometer. Okay, you can do this at any time. And uh, P1, you measure H1 using manometer plus the atmosphere measured by barometer. And similarly, P3 is calculated by uh, H3 measured by manometer plus barometer. The equation to calculate gamma is here. Okay. 
which we use uh, P1, P2, P3. We measure at least one monatomic gas and a diatomic gas. And if we have time, we can also measure a polyatomic uh, molecule such as CO2. Uh, you calculate gamma using experimental data and using equipartition theorem. Now using this equation, Cp equals Cv plus R, you calculate Cv, okay? And based on your calculations and the theoretical results, can you tell if rotation and vibration contribute to the heat capacity?